All right, already. Let's check out what's been going on with the Synod and join Days of Decision 2. Um, first of all, I guess we'll look over here since this is where the camera's pointing. We see France's huge stack of allies, not allies, but ideological buddies. Um, one thing I've come to, to realize when playing this game is that if you're on the edge like France is, it's easy to draw people in. But it's because, you know, they're there, boom, they're close. But it's harder, I think, it, or it's also easy to pull them away just because of how the points work. Um, so if they were, so say if the USA had an ally and they're in, in here, or better yet, we'll go with the fascists who actually have, I keep saying allies, but they're not allies necessarily. They actually have ideological buddies. If um, they're in here, to move them away, it costs four. If you're on the edge like this, it only costs three to move them away, points. And those are, if you don't know the game, are gonna feel kind of abstract to you, but you know that three is less than four, so it's easier to do. Um, and plus, once they're out here, you know, outside of the ideological bubble, then even if they're one space away from you, you no longer get any benefit from them. Whereas if you're in the middle, like Germany, who also has quite a few, well, I say you can't really go by size of stack because they also have their alliance markers under there. And that's true alliance, not ideological buddies. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. I think if, if they move away from Germany here, they're still going to be within the ideological bubble. So Germany gets some benefit, although it's a lesser benefit. So that's something that's been going on. Um, I guess that, that draws my eyes down to England here, who has the Spanish Republic under them on the outside of the democratic socialist bubble. Spanish Civil War ended with a, with a, a republic success, which is counter to history. Uh, why is that? Well, one, their big partner, unlike the real world, was England. There wasn't any sort of like trying to appease the, the fascists of the world by, by saying, oh, we're, everyone stay out of it. Um, historically, they said to everyone stay out of it, but then Germany and Italy didn't stay out of it, and then Russia started helping a little bit, or help, they helped quite a bit, but to a lesser extent than Germany or Italy, who had a very direct hand in what was going on. Um, and England just kept going. The others kind of, so Germany and Japan was helping out for a little bit too, helped for a while, but then they just kind of stopped and started doing other things, whereas England kept going until Spain was was now this, I guess, democratic socialist state, which is maybe or maybe not what would have happened historically if, if that happened. I mean, this is this is all very different. I don't know why I'm talking about history anymore because this, this is a different world we live in. This is Days of Decision 2, the way the Synod enjoys it. Uh, how else does the Synod enjoy it? They enjoy a powerful France. France, uh, if the game were to end right now, France would be the winner. They have five points. I did a, I think... Okay, so maybe I should talk about how the points work. So you see these little red cities here? Let me get out of the light. That um, is worth a point if you control that city. Okay, and um, so if, in order to tally points, I kind of have to look throughout the whole world and just figure out where all the little cities are and who controls it and kind of go by there. But as you can see, like especially if you get down here, it gets kind of hard to tell. Um, so... I say France is winning. They probably are, but the exact numbers are maybe off. Um, who else is doing well? I think China. Was it China that has a point? And Italy has zero points. Yeah, I think China has one point. Italy has zero, and everyone else is in the negative. Uh, why is why are they in the negative? Well, one, it's been a very peaceful game. The only real we've had two wars going on. We had the Spanish Civil War, which is over, and then we had the Italian Ethiopian War, which is over, um, and. That's it. So I think some powers have... Oh, the, the other thing about the points is they have different different things they're shooting for. So I can have the rule book handy here. You can take a look at it. Okay, so if we look at the total needed column there, that's what they need. And so you compare their total to, to that and do a little subtraction. So France has nine controlled cities. Nine minus four is five, and that's how I got five. All right, and... You know, see, so Germany, who has, I think, the lowest score, they have a lot that they need to get. So, you know, it makes sense. Uh, England, they also have a lot that they need to get, but they start out with a lot. And our England, 
uh, they start out with a lot because of all their colonies everywhere. They have a lot there. Our England is actually kind of lost some of their starting cities because they've kind of had a policy of withdrawal back into the island. Uh, so they, they helped out Spain, but other than that, they're not really getting involved in, in foreign affairs too much. doesn't seem. They, they pulled out of Australia. They gave India their independence recently. So that's that's huge news there. Production-wise, I think everyone except for the U.S. is at their peacetime maximum. U.S. could go up one more. China just got theirs bumped up, which is still kind of piddly, but that's why China and the U.S. are played by one one player. They're both kind of hampered in different ways. Um, what else? Germany's done kind of all its special options, land grab things, grabbed Sudetenland, uh, grabbed Danzig. I think that happened last time. All sorts of stuff. Um, Germany's recently been seeing some hindrance because uh, some of their their places where they have economic markers here are in other people's camps. So Sweden is actually friends with China, uh, ideological buddies with China. So Germany no longer gets access to those that resource there. And so they have the factories, but not the resources. Russia is our big earner right now. They, um, they're maxed out with all their their factories and stuff, and they, they have a bunch of factories in the pipe, so they could become a huge juggernaut as things go on. Uh, Japan, they maxed out, but they, they have uh, poor access to resources, and that's been bothering them. And if they ever get, get in trouble with the U.S., if they ever stop being buddies with the U.S., you know, I think over half their resources are from the U.S. right now, so if the U.S. Cut, cuts that off, that could be a big problem for Japan. So they got to really be thinking about resources. France keep doing what they're doing. France's main, I think, issue is um, worrying about losing the, the people that they have stacked with them. So a lot of them, like Poland's really nice because Poland gives you a factory. Most of the minor powers don't give you a factory. They just give you resources. So you're kind of capped at what you have unless you can get one of those minor powers uh, to be friends with you. And I think France has both Poland and Czechoslovakia, which, which is you know two factories right there. Not a lot on the board. You see Turkey has one. Um, Italy made a lot of economic agreements, but you know those get superseded by econ by ideological buddies. Uh, so they're they're kind of changing their tack to just kind of make trying to work on making ideological buddy friends, and I, I think that could pay off for them. We'll see. U.S. hasn't had a lot of opportunity to move, um, and I think did I leave anyone out? Did I talk about everybody? I think I talked about everybody. All right. Uh, oh, it's 1937. I don't know if I said that. Here's how things are looking. We're coming up on July and August.